Nothing But The Truth. Hello, I'm Raj Chengapa of India Today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. Every week, I'll bring you insights and clarity on a major topical issue that matters to you without holding back on the truth. History has a nasty habit of repeating itself in Pakistan. It's been close to 10 days now since the elections were held and results are out, but there is still no clarity as to what the contours of the new Pakistan government uh, that will take charge will be like. The only major development is that the two major political parties, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz or PMLN and the People's Party of Pakistan or PPP are likely to combine forces and form a government there. Both these parties had been opposed to Imran Khan and his Pakistan Tariqi Insaf or PTI, which performed surprisingly well in the elections and remains a force to reckon with. Former Pakistan Prime Minister Sheba Sharif, the younger brother of Nawaz Sharif, is expected to take over again, but everyone says it's going to be an uphill task for him. So in this episode of Nothing But The Truth, we will look at why Shivas Sharif wears a crown of thorns and also why the chances of him surviving a full term as Prime Minister remains bleak. By the way, no Pakistan Prime Minister since independence has survived a full term in Parliament. And that's a statement by itself. But first, a bit of background in the run-up to the elections. Pakistan's cricket icon Imran Khan became the Prime Minister for the first time in 2018, after he was able to cobble together a simple majority. Khan, ironically, was backed by, uh, by the army, the Pakistan army, the all-powerful Pakistan army. And I recall that when I'd gone to Islamabad soon after he was elected, he told press reporters that he and the army was on the same page. At that time, the PMLN and the PPP accused the army of playing politics and Khan was the beneficiary of that politics. But within four years, Pakistan's Imran Khan fell out uh, with his mentors as he tried to play politics uh, over who should succeed the then army chief, uh, General Bajwa. That saw the Pakistan cricket captain being ousted in April 2022 by a no confidence vote in parliament. And it was clearly seen that he had fallen out with the establishment, that the very establishment that had propelled him to the prime minister's post in 2018. The PMNL and the PPP then joined hands together under the banner of the Progressive Democratic Movement, or PDM, that also had a host of other parties and formed a government with Shabazz Sharif becoming prime minister. Now, after that, uh, and in fact, during that whole period, the establishment or the army pretty much rehabilitated Nawaz Sharif, who was ousted as prime minister in 2017, and uh, had, uh, in fact, uh, this was during the fourth year of his third term, and he returned after spending almost six years in disgrace, including a four-year exile abroad. His past uh, criminal uh, convictions and misdemeanors, including his run-ins with the army brass, uh, were pardoned by the courts, and uh, apparently the army uh, brought him in to uh, politically checkmate Imran Khan. Also, let's not forget that uh, the army was further angered by the mini insurrection that Imran Khan's backers had engineered. And uh, if you recall, they had attacked even the Rawalpindi headquarters and also burned down the residence of its Lahore Corps commander, all this in May 2023. Now, the new army chief, General Asim Munir, who had succeeded uh, General Bajwa, ordered a statewide crackdown on all those included involved in the violence, and uh, including, of course, Imran Khan. And Khan has been under uh, arrest since May 2023 and has received since then prison sentences uh, running up uh, to around 14 years in three back-to-back -back convictions. Two of them slapped on him a week before the elections. Now let's analyze the Pakistan election results. The Pakistan National Assembly, the equivalent of the Lok Sabha in India, has 266 seats in the general category. That means that any party that hopes to form a government has to have a simple majority of 134 seats. In all, the National Assembly has 76 more seats that are reserved for women, non-Muslims, and tribal areas. Now, these 76 additional seats are allotted on the basis 
of proportionate representation based on the number of votes polled and seats won among the general seats. So for all practical purposes, it is the general seats that determine it. And as I mentioned, it needs a simple majority of 134 seats for any party to form a government. Now, in the run-up to the general election, the Election Commission of Pakistan banned the PTI from contesting as a party. It froze its party symbol. And uh, by the way, the party symbol is the bat. Uh, for not adhering to rules stipulating intra-party polls. So Imran Khan and his party men were forced to fight as independents. Yet, despite Imran Khan being lodged in jail, he and his supporters pulled off a surprisingly good show. Even the establishment was stunned by the results. Now, the independents affiliated with Pakistan's uh, Tariq e Insaf or uh, Imran Khan's party won 93 out of the 265 general seats contested in the National Assembly. One of those seats, uh, uh, the election was deferred, and therefore others would have been 266. Now, though well short of the minimum of, of uh, 134 uh, seats required for a majority, Imran Khan's PTI, uh, the share of its seats, was the largest among all the parties. Sharif's uh, PMLN, or Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, won only 75 seats. The Bilawal Bhutto-led uh, PPP, or Pakistan's People Party, came in third with 54 seats, and the MQM P stood fourth with 17, with the rest of the seats going to uh, over a dozen smaller parties. Now, the PTI announced that it will go to the courts to challenge the results in 80-odd seats. It is charging the Election Commission and the establishment, uh, which, of course, in Pakistan means the all-powerful army, with manipulation of poll results. Now, this is ironical because last time in 2018, PTI or Imran Khan had been favored by the army to take power. On his part, uh, the caretaker prime minister of Pakistan, Anwarul Haq Kakhar, whose government oversaw the election process. Pakistan has this uh, thing of having an interim prime minister to conduct the elections. And uh, Kakhar defended the results, arguing that if rigging had really been planned, would those that won the highest number of seats have been allowed to win them. This is what he said, meaning the PTI was allowed. If, if there was rigging, do you think the PTI could have got the kind of numbers that it did? Good argument, but let's go, let's take it further. With no single party in a position to form a government on its own uh, at the national level and none of them in favor of having another general election, a coalition government was the only way forward. Now, uh, Imran Khan from jail ruled out the option of the PTI joining up with any other of the main parties. Therefore, the only alternative was that what some are dubbing as the PDM 2.0 or the Progressive Democratic Movement 2.0, which is a reference to the PDM coalition that took over for a year and a half after Imran's government lost power. Now, both the PMLNN and the PPP were an integral part of the PDM government, and they can easily get the numbers uh, this time to run a coalition. But there are further complications. There are deep fractures uh, in the provincial assembly, just as in the national assembly, uh, and these elections were held simultaneously along with the national assembly. In Punjab's Pakistan, which is its most powerful province, the PMLN won 137 out of the total of 297 general seats, which is 12, shots of a, uh, 12 short of a simple majority of 149 seats. Now, this was largely because of Imran Khan's PTI's unexpectedly uh, good performance, where it won 116 seats, which meant it virtually split the vote almost right down the middle. In KPK province, uh, the PTI, which is a frontier province, uh, won an overwhelming majority, bagging 84 out of its 115 general seats, and will form the government in this frontier, a very restive frontier province. The country's third big player, the PPP, retained its own stronghold of Sindh with winning, uh, by winning 84 out of the 130 general seats. Baluchistan had an intriguing three-way split, that could see the PPP form a government with a coalition. So now let's look at the options for the key political players and how will it pan out. Let's start with the government formation. Currently, there will be plenty of hard bargaining, as we are seeing, between the PMLN and the PPP, 
And this makes it far from smooth sailing to form a government. From whatever we are hearing in the newspapers and uh, the discussions that are going on, it seems that former Premier Shabazz Sharif, rather than his elder brother Nawaz Sharif, will be the new Prime Minister. Now, Nawaz Sharif had already indicated before the elections that he would not like to become Prime Minister for a fourth time if the PMLN did not get a clear mandate in the election. Political experts also say that the military had quietly indicated its preference for working with Shabazz. Now, remember, in the past, they were more comfortable with dealing with Shabazz Sharif rather than Nawaz Sharif, who was prone to striking out a more independent path. Both the PPP co-chairman, Bilawal Bhutto Zadari, and the PMLN president, Sheba Sharif, announced that they were forming the government. And they said it was in the larger interests of the country, uh, seemed to be rather than out of any great joy of being together. Now, even though the PMLN aggressively campaigned on slogans that uh, Nawaz Sharif would be the prime minister, many an had anticipated that the elder Sharif was actually trying to create political space for a succession. And this succession was for his 50-year-old daughter, Maryam, who, uh, therefore, uh, Nawaz Sharif was not only seeking vindication for his being wrongly removed as prime minister for power, prime minister uh, removed from power in uh, 2017, he also wanted Maryam to uh, succeed him. And therefore, he may have achieved both the goals. But a lot will now depend on the Punjab chief minister-elect, Maryam Nawaz, uh, in delivering, because this is particularly uh, Punjab, which is a highly sensitive state. And here, the PMLN has been facing anger of the younger, upwardly mobile uh, population, uh, very ambitious. And we have seen that resentment spilling out during the elections, where uh, many of the traditional parties, including the PML, uh, PMLN, uh, have not been voted to power as they should or had expected to be in this case. Now let's examine the options that Bilawal Bhutto and the PPP has, the other major party. And it is not clear whether Shabazz will be leading a minority government, because for now, the PPP has been wavering on as to how it will give its support. There were reports that the PPP is not seeking cabinet positions in the new government, though it says it will support the PMLN to form the government. Now, the PPP's reluctance to become a direct partner in the government perhaps comes from the realization that formal power at this junction may be truly a crown of thorns. There's also the party's public misgivings about the experience it had with the previous PDM government and the consideration of um, how it will ally with its erstwhile rivals uh, and will that play out and affect its political fortunes in the future. With the PPP deciding to give outside support to the PMLN at the federal level, senior leaders within the uh, Nawaz uh, section of the party actually express resentment over the sense that uh, what they call the PPP wants to have its cake and eat it too. Now, there is talk that the PPP has asked the PMLN for the presidency and all the four provincial governorships, as well as the slots of the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Senate Chairman in return for its support. Interestingly, not only will it, mean, it probably mean a return to the presidency of Asif Ali Zadari, uh, the father of Bilawal Bhutto, but all these constitutional posts that they are seeking will continue to exist even in the event of an early dissolution of the assemblies. However, lately there has been even talk of Bilawal Bhutto pushing for a rotational PM ship uh, with Sheba Sharif uh, which will see that uh, Shabazz Sharif gets a period of three years, and then Bilawal Bhutto will take over as prime minister after two years. However, staying out of the government may be the smartest strategy for the PPP, given the circumstances and the fact that Bilawal Bhutto may be looking uh, to the future to consolidate the gains the PPP has made in these elections. Also, let's not forget, at 35 years old, Bilawal Bhutto has time on his side and he can wait. Now let's examine Imran Khan's options. Against all expectations, as I had mentioned earlier, the PTI, PTI or the uh, Pakistan Tariqi Insaf Party has managed to do what no other party before has ever managed in the face of such pressure from the army 
and the state. The results have certainly given Imran Khan a huge shot in the arm. But does it mean that Imran Khan could soon be out and free again? That, say experts, doesn't seem likely. There are still plenty of obstacles for the PTI. There are also uh, the other issues. Uh, technically, all independents uh, are outside the constraints of the party discipline, and fears are being expressed that the other parties may try and poach uh, their, his MLAs, and they could be the formation, as it has been in the past, of what is called the King's Party, which essentially the army backs and ensures that there's stability for a government. We have seen a certain amount of trickle that has already started heading towards the PMLN. So to prevent this from happening, it is possible that Imran Khan and the PTI will ask its independent members to join a smaller party that is recognized by the Election Commission of Pakistan for these assemblies and possibly also for the National Assembly. The other question or the other big question is, does the PTI have the street power to unleash chaos through protests as it did in May 2023? This also seems unlikely, especially in the light of the major crackdown after its last uh, adventure that happened, as I said, a year ago. Uh, but there is a, uh, also another consideration. The state and even the PMLN might want to reduce the polarization in the country by giving the PTI some concessions. In the immediate term, though, there is no possibility that uh, a recalcitrant uh, Imran uh, Khan will be given a free hand and be allowed to join politics as he did before. Uh, experts uh, on Pakistan, of Pakistan's political scene believe that without any out of, out of the ordinary, or out of the box developments, political temperatures will uh, eventually cool down. And uh, the task for the, for the PTI and its charismatic leader, Imran Khan, in such a situation will be to sustain itself until it gets another chance at the polls, as we have seen that Nawaz Sharif had waited and then is now back, though not in power as he would have hoped to be. Meanwhile, if and when Shabazz Sharif takes over as prime minister, there's still an if, because we don't know, negotiations are on, he will certainly be wearing a crown of thorns. That's because Pakistan's economy remains in a shambles. Not only has there been a contraction in growth, the country faces a high public debt. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, has projected that Pakistan's external debt touched $130 billion in 2023-24. Now, its uh, debt to GDP ratio stands at an unsustainable 75%. Ironically, much of this is because of Imran Khan's mismanagement while in power, though the blame has now accrued to the PDM government that succeeded him. Mind you, inflation continues to hover at 40%, and the prices of all essentials, including fruits, vegetables, and petrol, have soared, and so the people are clearly unhappy. Now the country will still need plenty of harsh measures for its economy to recover, and this will no doubt be extremely unpopular on, on the streets of Pakistan. There is also consensus that the country will have to enter into another uh, restrictive IMF uh, support program almost immediately after a new government takes over. Uh, there is expected to be a new round of privati privatization of state-owned white elephants, uh, such as the National Airline PIA and the Pakistan Steel Mills, which is also on the cards. Now, this will undoubtedly cause labor resentment. The flailing economy and its recovery will then be the biggest test for the Sharif brothers. Having analyzed the options available to all the major political parties, now let's look at all uh, the all-powerful Pakistan army and its options that are there. There is widespread resentment of political parties against the army, and especially after Imran Khan's surprisingly good showing that has challenged the army's dominance. But in the larger scheme of things, the split uh, mandate or the split mandate is also a godsend for the military's, uh, military top brass and those that engineered these elections or allegedly did so. Since uh, experts say this, arg uh, they argue that the army uh, has more room to pressurize political actors and cajole them into a formation 
that it wants to finally rule the state. However, what it does show, all this does show, is that the establishment or the army cannot guarantee any scenarios anymore and that there are limits to its powers to influence the democratic uh, politics of Pakistan. Given Pakistan's precarious economic situation, the establishment also recognizes that political stability is the foremost prerequisite for any economic recovery. Also, without a focus on the economy, even the armed army's own position as an institution may be endangered. However, the army does have options. If these two don't get together, the army may even decide to persist with the caretaker government for, and uh, leave out both the PMLN and PPP and push for fresh elections after a period of six months or even later. But that is still a risky strategy. So the challenge for Army Chief General Asim Munir will be to balance this demand uh, you know, of uh, the political establishment that ex exists with the military's continued belief uh, that it is the ultimate savior of Pakistan and also the arbiter of the country's national interests. Finally, let's turn to the question as to how all these developments will impact India-Pakistan relations. The Sharif brothers, Nawaz and Shehbaz, have been known to push for friendly ties with India. But even though they are back in power, all major foreign policy initiatives will be determined by the Pakistan army as is the norm. It will have the veto on foreign relations. For a while, when former army chief, General Kamar Javed Bajwa, was in charge of the establishment, he had surprised even the political class by advocating peace in the neighborhood, including better ties with India, and talked of fighting extremism and eliminating terrorism, these are demands that India had wanted. Now, Pakistan had downgraded ties with India after the abrogation of Article 370 in August 2019. It angrily expelled India's High Commissioner in Islamabad, suspended trade ties, severed all transport links, and banned all cultural exchanges including the screening of Indian films and dramas in their country. But General Bajwa, in March 21, 2021, took a seemingly conciliatory turn when he told the gathering at Islamabad Security Dialogue, and I'm quoting him, in quotes he says, it is time to bury the past and move forward, but for the resumption of the peace process or meaningful dialogue, our neighbor will have to create a conducive environment, particularly in India, Indian occupied Kashmir, or IOK as they call it. For India, there are two major pre uh, prerequisites to resume dialogue. One is that Pakistan turn off its terror tap and also to drop any demand for restoration of Article 370 in JNK, which India regards as a purely internal matter. And though India considers every new Pakistan government and military dispensation as an opportunity to prove, improve ties with it, Indian experts say that uh, General Asim Munir who has been army chief since November 2022, has yet to reveal his approach on relations with India. Also, since it was Pakistan that downgraded ties with India, the ball is now in Islamabad's court. So India is content to wait and watch. The theme of wait and watch is also relevant to the current Pakistan political situation, where clarity needs to come as to who will finally rule Pakistan and they form the government over there. For more details, you could read uh, the latest issue of India Today magazine, which has an in-depth cover story written by uh, my colleague and uh, longtime contributor, Hassan Zaidi, who is based in Pakistan, uh, writes from Karachi, and has been writing for India Today for the last two decades. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nothing But The Truth. I look forward to having you with me next time. Nothing But The Truth.